Hello and welcome to the first webinar in our Essentials of Fleet Safety webinar series. The Essentials of Fleet Safety is a series of five 60-minute webinars to give champions the essential elements of running a fleet safety program. The webinars are based on the five pillars of the Global Fleet Champions campaign. Today's webinar focuses on the driver behaviour pillar and is sponsored by Allianz. Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Break, the road safety charity, to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. To learn more about the campaign and what we do, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. At today's webinar, you will learn how to write an effective fleet safety policy and driver handbook, as well as how to plan a driver training and education program. On your screen now, you should be able to see a multiple choice question poll so we can find out your views on this topic. It is anonymous, simply select one answer and press submit and we will discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which is your opportunity to ask some of today's presenters any questions you might have. You can put forward your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on the webinar panel. Thank you for your time and the webinar will now begin. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Sherman. I'm a commercial motor manager at Allianz head office in Guildford. I was very pleased to be given the opportunity by Brake to contribute to this webinar and provide an overview of dangerous driving behaviours. So, what is dangerous driving behaviour? In our opinion, a very complex and wide-ranging topic, and over the next 10 minutes or so, I'll look at, from an Allianz perspective, some examples of poor driving behaviour and what causes people to behave in a manner that puts other road users and members of the public at risk. As in life generally, Actions have consequences, and I'll pick up what these may be and how, with a considered approach, driving behaviour can improve. In most countries, driving requires you to demonstrate a level of competency that satisfies an examiner. But passing our driving test doesn't make us a good driver with good behaviours. Over time, both good and poor driving habits impact the way we drive and affect our attitude towards driving. Consequently, there's a vast range of physical and behavioural driving capability across the driving community. Even those amongst us who consider ourselves to be good or better drivers than the average can and do display poor driving behaviours. Although, when we get up in the morning, I don't believe any of us have a conscious mindset to drive poorly. That said, there are numerous external influences that may have an impact on our mental and physical state that we take with us when we get into a vehicle. Modern living, both socially and occupationally, is pressurised and complex, and with so much crammed into our lives, our physical and mental state can be impacted by how effective we are at managing our waking and sleeping hours. Poor driving behaviours can be caused by pressure placed on drivers by an employer. A business profit margins can be negatively impacted by greater competition, perhaps as a result of factors such as market capacity or even Brexit and they can and do result in the need for a business to review their operations. To survive, they have to run leaner, which can and does mean increased vehicle and driver utilisation. Unless a business has the right organisational culture, this can mean greater pressure placed on individuals to meet deadlines, which in turn can result in poor driving behaviours. This can result in a downward spiral of poor driving behaviours such as tiredness, distractions, perhaps due to multitasking using in-vehicle devices whilst driving, excessive acceleration as well as harsh braking, tailgating, food and drink consumption whilst driving as drivers have no time for rest breaks. This can lead to erratic and dangerous driving, abuse of road users including vulnerable cyclists and pedestrians. These are all examples of a driver's behaviour that may be demonstrated as a result of pressures placed on the individual by an employer. Even businesses who recognise and avoid the impact of increased driver utilisation can have drivers who demonstrate poor driving behaviours unless the culture within the business monitors and regularly reviews the performance and behaviour of its employees. Being able to identify this can allow a business which actively promotes a good driving culture to understand when an employee may be exposed to external pressures or influences outside of work. Stuff that goes on outside of the workplace can add stress and fatigue that manifests itself in a poor driving attitude or lack of concentration resulting in poor driving. Stress and fatigue can, for example, have an impact on a person's mental and physical well-being. The stoic approach embodied by many can add to stress levels and in more severe cases lead to health-related problems 
which in some extreme cases can result in an individual seeking solace in drink and drug abuse as an ill-conceived coping mechanism. Most of the examples given thus far are a result of drivers reacting to circumstances which are either self-imposed or as a result of pressures imposed by business. There are situations where it is not the intention of the driver to cut corners, leading to poor driving, but where the corners are cut by the employer, which may subconsciously result in poor driving by the employee. As mentioned earlier, slim margins can result in a business looking to find ways to trade more effectively, allowing them to compete with their peers. It is not uncommon that risk management can be one of the first areas some businesses look to save a few pennies. This may manifest itself in the lack of servicing of vehicles in line with manufacturer's guidelines. Ensuring the business promotes the right attitude to driving is important, and how vehicles are cared for can affect the way they are driven. Taking pride in a vehicle often promotes better driver behaviours. Arrogant and overly confident drivers often demonstrate many of the behaviours we are talking about today, perhaps leading to a failure to understand, engage with, or even ignore vehicle safety features. An employer who does not adopt post-incident reporting interviews fails to take an, an opportunity to address any poor driving behaviours and could be seen by its employees as tolerating the driver's actions. So what are the consequences of poor driving? The most obvious are road crashes and the visible costs of these are the vehicle repairs, the excess that has to be paid and the potential increase of insurance premium as a result of the crash at renewal of the policy. Costs are often compared to an iceberg as a hidden and unevaluated cost, that's that larger bit of the iceberg below the waterline, are generally much greater than those that are visible, that smaller tip of the iceberg above the waterline. As well as dealing with the bent metal, hidden and unevaluated costs can include interrupted work schedules and reduced operational efficiency due to vehicle downtime, lost time of injured employees, additional workloads placed on other staff due to the vehicle downtime. Cost of out-of-service vehicles, potential loss of business due to breakdown in customer contact, and even adverse image and reputational costs. However, there are additional costs incurred by poor driving behaviours, even when there is no collision. And these can include increased fuel costs brought about by harsh acceleration and braking, higher maintenance costs as a result of aggressive driving, poor external company image resulting in poor feedback, complaints, and impacting orders. So what can improve driver behaviour? In our view, this starts from an organisational perspective. Employers have a duty of care to the employees, and this extends to include the safety of journeys driven on behalf of business. So there should be careful driver selection and recruitment, and this should take into account an individual's driving behaviour. Understanding what these might be can perhaps be based on an initial driver assessment or a probationary period. Other steps include availability and access to professional coaching and training perhaps based on a driver assessment or use of real-time telemetry to identify certain poor behaviours. Identification is only the first step and subsequent remedial action planning is vital. Telematics can provide significant data for analysis, however many choose only to use it for track and tracing route maximisation. Careful work and journey planning can help to avoid excessive time pressures and issues with driver fatigue. Driver workloads should be reviewed to ensure these are reasonable, and we shouldn't forget that employers can, who ignore this can, in the extreme, leave themselves exposed to corporate manslaughter prosecution. It's important for organisations to ensure that employees are fully aware of the standards and expectations when it comes to driving at work and associated behaviours. They must understand the responsibilities, and these must be made clear and the results of falling below expected standards communicated. Give driving behaviour visibility within a business. Use of regular forums, so a regular agenda item in meetings, for example, to seek feedback on driver performance, highlight the importance and impacts of driving and any particular areas of concern. It is critical that there's buy-in, and this starts at board level and is driven downwards throughout the business. Access to MI that supports good driving behaviour should be rewarded. And in our experience, positive reward schemes are often more effective than negative ones. Corrective and supportive coaching and training should be available to promote good behaviours and this requires implementation of systems and processes that allow a business to capture incidents as well as near misses with the learnings then openly communicated and process and actions reviewed. Drug and alcohol testing should be considered and built into employment contracts where possible. 
Expressing an interest and understanding your employees helps give an early heads up to personal situations that you may otherwise be blind to. Be clear of what is expected of drivers when in a company vehicle and be open to feedback. To sum up, poor driving behaviours can be annoying for employers and road users. However, at the other end of the spectrum, they can be financially costly for business and potentially devastating for vulnerable road users. Thank you. Welcome to this short webinar on driver health and wellbeing. Over the next 10 minutes, we'll just be taking a quick look at some of the uh, main conditions that can affect your driving. Um, as it's a global audience, I won't be making too many references to any specific countries, legislation or licensing requirements. And it is really important you do check back with your own bodies in your own countries. OK, so driving, just to set the scene, can be thought of as a cognitive task. Basically, our brains are bombarded with millions of pieces of information every second, and we just can't physically cope with it all. Our brain has a really sophisticated filtering system, and what this does filters out the important things from the less important. And this is built upon our own internal reference map that we have. Your brain then decides on what action is needed, and this may be conscious or it may be an unconscious reaction. When the brain's decided what it needs to do, it elicits this response through the central nervous system, that web of uh, wires and electrical signals that are carried through the body. And this typically leads to a physical response through the movement of muscles and joints and bones. As you can imagine, anything that has the chance to impair any part of that pathway will affect our driving. If it's the senses through the eyes or through the ears, then it's really going to affect what information our brain can receive. If it, the issue lies with the brain and the cognitive processing, such as fatigue, stress, anxiety, hyperglycemia and drugs and alcohol and medication, then this is going to affect the signals we receive and how we react to them. If the issues with the central nervous system, such as epilepsy, uh, multiple sclerosis, and again, drugs and alcohol and medications, then again, there is going to be a difference in the reaction that we can take. That there just summarises some of the, the typical factors that can affect driving. And we are going to focus mainly on the top two today. OK, so starting quickly with eyesight, any impairment to vision will affect what you can see and therefore what you can perceive and therefore what you react to. Obviously, the issue with these things are going to affect what signals on the brain receives and therefore can respond to. I guess the worrying thing with eyesight is that um, I think in the UK alone, less than a quarter of all drivers have had an eye test in the last two years. Um, and I think that the problem with eyesight is massively undetected and unreported. This is a tree collision um, and this is where eyesight was um, one of the contributing factors. It was a mechanic for a coach company. He didn't have a PSV license, but he did have road testing as part of his job and he was registered blind. He hadn't reported it to the employer and the employer didn't have any robust uh, procedures in place for carrying out license checks. Um, he joined an expressway, a dual carriageway, and didn't see a cyclist on his offside and sadly the cyclist was struck and was killed. Moving on to medical conditions now, I'm just going to provide a very brief overview. Apnea is hitting the headlines quite a lot because of the prevalence. Um, it's estimated that one and a half million people alone in the UK have it, um, but about 85% of people are undiagnosed. Um, and it's caused by people falling asleep and as they fall asleep, their airway closes over, starves their body of oxygen and the brain wakes them up. This cycle can happen many times throughout the night, leading them to having no rest and no repair. So they wake up every day and they're exceedingly tired. So obviously one of the obvious dangers is falling asleep at the wheel. It does also affect the cognitive processing, their judgment um, as well. So it, it has many reaching effects. Diabetes, one of the main risks is hyperglycemia. Uh, the brain relies on glucose as a source of fuel. And the part of your brain that relies most on it is the frontal part, which is the part that's involved in decision making. So when glu uh, glucose levels falls, obviously there's that dizziness, there's confusion, um, and obviously it can lead to a coma if it's not treated. There are other complications with diabetes as well, uh, which can affect your vision and also sensation and feeling in the hands and the feet. Epilepsy um, is a disruption of the electrical signals in the brain. And it can be typically thought of as your main seizures, where you typically see people fall into the floor in a state of um, alternating rigour. 
but also can experience uh, absences. Uh, so they may look like nothing's wrong, but their brain has kind of gone off to another place. The signals are all mixed up. And the sense of deja vu can indicate epilepsy. So it's really important that you people are aware of these symptoms. This was a, a crash involving a HGV driver on a motorway. Um, he fell asleep at the wheel of a car, crashed over the central reservation. That still didn't wake him up. And he proceeded to drive for a mile whilst still asleep facing oncoming traffic. Uh, thankfully, no one was killed. It was only by sheer luck, uh, but some people were seriously injured. He presented with symptoms but he hadn't presented to the GP and he actually had undiagnosed sleep apnea. He was jailed for nine months for dangerous driving. And the prevalence of apnea amongst HDV drivers is thought to be around 15%. Okay, so fatigue, again, it's, it's a real underreported problem, mainly because we haven't got a breath test or a blood test that can prove that fatigue was the causation or contributory factor. The issue with fatigue, it reduces concentration, your ability to react to situations, to process information. It can impair your judgment and also make you take more risks. The issue with fatigue, if it leads to you falling asleep at the wheel, um, often means that the severity of the collision is going to be worse. Um, maybe because you can't take evasive action if you're asleep or drowsy. There are many medical conditions and medications that can increase these fatigue levels. This was a collision um, where fatigue was thought to be the contributing factor. Um, it was a lady driver and she was on a motorway and had passed through three gantries warning of a speed uh, reduction. She didn't respond to any of them. She then approached the traffic moving much slower than her but reacted late and lost control whilst trying to take that evasive action striking two road workers who were putting out cones. Um, she killed the two workmen and herself and all that damage on the car has come from striking the workforce. When they looked into the patterns leading up to the collision, um, fatigue was indicated as a, a likely candidate for the, the collision cause. OK, so stress. Stress and anxiety are very physiological responses to stimulus, whether it is situational from when we're sat in our car to whether there's an underlying health condition leading to them. Stress and anxiety do bring about real physiological symptoms such as increased heart rate, increased breathing, irrational behaviour, pins and needles. And it can also make us behave uh, much more unpredictably and rash without our normal uh, range of judgment. It is linked with us taking more risks as a driver when we're feeling stressed or anxious. And obviously there's a spectrum that, you know, this can range from mild kind of fear right the way up to maybe having a panic attack behind the wheel of a car. This stress road rage incident in which a van driver and HDV driver were engaged in a bit of a tussle of road rage on the motorway. The usual of, you know, flashing lights, using their horns, gestures. And it progressed as they left the motorway onto a local road. Van driver gets out and starts shouting at the HDV driver and HDV driver proceeds to run him over and kills him. In court, he says he didn't see him, uh, but then previous evidence was brought in of persistent and aggressive road rage and he was charged with murder. So I know that's been really whistle stop tour. We're just going to look briefly at the next element of, of what do we do about it? It's all very well knowing some of those facts, but then what do we do about it and why should we? Those familiar with health and safety legislation will be aware of the, the moral and legal and financial reasons for, for taking action. And yes, financial and legal are extremely important. But for me, I think, you know, we're all good people. We've, we've logged into this webinar for a reason. We want our employees to go home safe to their families. And we don't want anyone to be uh, impacted by our acts or our emissions and live with the consequences for, for the rest of our lives. So for me, it's, it's really important to take this call to action. Some of the things we need to do then. So as an employer, it is vital you have a robust driving for work policy. Um, and there's many different things you will consider in this. But certainly you want to think about the disclosure of medical conditions and medications, considering your driver and work hours, considering overnighters, commutes, um, you know, working patterns. Considering linking with ophthalmic professionals for eyesight checks and think about your license checking procedure. Is it just an annual check? Are you checking for codes on the back? Are you looking for endorsements? What, how much are you finding out from what you're carrying out? Make sure you have a pre-plan in place. There's no point just reacting to these as and when they come because we probably won't make the right decision. Linking up with occupational health specialists can really be beneficial. 
It's really important to have a suitable and sufficient driver risk assessment, identify your hazards and your controls and communicate them to staff and make them relevant to the industry you're in, not just a generic off the shelf driver's risk assessment. It must really reflect the work that you do. Ensure that these policies are brought to life and don't just remain pieces of paper or something that's on the internet for someone to sign on their induction. Make sure that they are you know, reflected right the way through the business, right down to the people on the road, right the way through up to directors driving their own vehicles. And for me, obviously, from a training company perspective, it's vital to invest in education and training. And this is often the one that's overlooked. Um, you know, I think it's fantastic the amount of work that's going on with telematics and data at the minute. But my just concern is, is a lot of companies are stopping there. They're investing in these trackers and telematics, but then there's no sort of follow up to that. And it won't necessarily bring about the relevant behaviour change, which is where I think telematics and education awareness and change, you know, behaviour change is absolutely vital that they, they do come in together as a package. The manager's role is just to kind of filter that through from policies and procedures right the way down to the workforce. So making sure that they act with congruence, they're displaying the, the right behaviours, visible safety leadership, enforcing the policy, committing education, training resources and time, investigating collisions, incidents and near misses, and ensure that work is planned to take into account of stress, anxiety and fatigue. And perhaps one of the most important ones to me is to foster a culture of trust um, and support, not suspicion. Um, obviously, people will be reluctant to report conditions and medical uh, medications if they feel uh, that it means they may lose their job. So it's really important that it's support, not suspicion. And the solution from the employee's point of view, there is an absolute duty on the employee under the Road Traffic Act in the UK. It's just, it's there, it's black and white. They must inform the relevant license authority if they have a condition that may affect their ability to drive. Um, it is up to the driver to check the information to see if they need to notify them or not. Take advice from the GP, read the white sheet that's in the medication uh, box, but it's their accountability. Ignorance is no defence. So there definitely needs to be an awareness raised around their own accountability. OK, and from ourselves, that's just what we can offer bespoke packages to, to various companies out there um, from large to small education awareness training particularly around behavior change um, around not just medical conditions but the various other issues drugs alcohol distractions sat navs um, and so on i know there was a whistle stop tour and we couldn't go into a great deal um, a, a level of detail really but we would always welcome contact if you want to find out any more if you want to know anything else we you know we would love to take your calls or pop us an email on the contact information that's shown on your screen I hope you enjoy the rest of your webinar and I really look forward to taking some of your questions and answers later on. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Hemming. I am the UK Catalytics Director at Masternaut and I'm here today to talk to you about the importance of data in relation to telematics and safety. I'm going to run through a few subjects and some of the best practice pieces that we as a team recommend to our customers as they take on uh, the, the telematics journey and implement this as part of a driver safety tool. The business case for telematics is, is pretty well established now and using telematics to make in business improvements is why people implement this system in the first place. So telematics has moved on from uh, the use of track and trace reactive platforms to one where driver safety, often called driver behaviour, is, is used extensively as a real world application of telematics data. The combination of using real time feedback in the vehicle to the driver and then insight reporting for the manager that provides a fleet manager and all the people within a company organization clear information about how their drivers are driving, how their vehicles are being treated, and then how they can use that data to coach their drivers to be better in the future. The data provided within telematics gives a really clear benchmark to any fleet. And most importantly, it allows you to prioritize your resources around the worst drivers on your fleet, because it gives you a clear list and a priority of the best and the worst drivers. And then how you can then choose how you target your resources moving forward. 
I mentioned earlier that the business case for telematics has been pretty well proved, but also the safety benefits of telematics have been uh, pretty well proven over the years as well. Driver behavior is one of those pieces that uh, it really does impact the fleet performance of a fleet. And by avoiding harsh driving style, by getting your drivers to respect the road speed limits, and also turning their engine off when stopped, it, it translates into some real clear benefits for fleets. These are namely safety, sustainability, and savings. And so to say that if you look after the safety and the sustainability, then the savings look after themselves. It's just a measure of how well you're doing at the other pieces. I've got a couple of examples of where this has been uh, sort of proven uh, through our customer data. We performed a study uh, of our in-cab coaching device, there's a picture there on, on the slide, which gives live real-time feedback to the drivers. And we did this study across 9,000 vehicles. And what we found through that is that speeding instances were 53% less where the in-cab coach was active. And then there were fewer harsh driving events. So the average was 4.2 per hour of driving against 5.7 for those without the, uh, the in-cab coach. And so you can see there is a stark difference for those that have it active and those that have it inactive. Here we have uh, an example where a customer actually said, I want you to prove to me how the in-cab coach is making a difference to my fleet. And what we did through a controlled pilot with them is actually turned off the light bar uh, and the in-cab coach for that customer to see what the effect will be. And you can see I've highlighted here in the middle the speeding of that particular fleet. The first five weeks that you can see there in blue was where uh, the, the in-cab coach was active. And then for the red period in the middle, we had the in-cab coach inactive. And then the blue period at the end, we'd uh, turn the in-cab coach back on again. And that red section meant that there were 22% increase in speeding events due to the lack of feedback that a, a driver was, was receiving. So you can see that there is a, a really clear differentiator between the two states of the, of the coach and the effect it has on the safety and the data that you can see within the system. So this webinar is really to talk about the importance of the data. Uh, and, and we see the data as a real indicator of where you can focus your attention as, as a, uh, a fleet manager or a safety manager within a business. You can use the data to see clear information about how a, a driver and a particular group within, uh, within your business is operating. Some of the, uh, the metrics we use as a business, you've got smoother, where you're looking at harsh driving events, safer, looking at speeding over road speed, and the cleaner element is, to, is relating to the percentage of idle into driving. However, the key numbers here that it, it sort of shows you can get from telematics data is a short-term trend. Are they improving or are they getting worse yesterday versus the day before? Are they getting worse from last week to this week? And then the midterm trend shows you a slightly longer period of time. So are they improving or, uh, or getting worse over time? We also uh, include a benchmark where we measure all of our customers and say, well, this is what a customer with your vehicle types normally achieves. And it gives you some real numbers that you can talk to a driver about. And then broken out below are then the drivers with the best score, the ones that you can praise, and then the drivers to train and advise uh, that are the worst drivers on the fleet. So giving you that separation uh, allows you as a manager to educate and train your drivers through the data that you receive. Breaking that down a little bit further, the same information on the top, but broken down by driver. So not only are you getting benchmarks here for all of our Connect customers, that have this uh, driver behavior feature, but you can also see where you rate in terms of the company. Are you better and worse than your company average is, is a good metric to measure your drivers against. And then broken down below are some more details on a five week trend of how those numbers are uh, being presented. And as you can see, the uh, driver is getting a little bit worse from their harsh events. Uh, and then the, uh, but the idling is improving over time. So that would be something that I would be uh, talking to that particular driver about. The key part to, to any driver behavior and safety improvement program for me is, is really about how uh, we can keep the drivers engaged 
Uh, there's often a lot of fear over the, the telematic system, the black box, the big brother aspect. However, if you keep the drivers informed, if you keep them engaged through the process, this really is key to success in how you can use the data to improve the safety on your fleet. I've broken this down into two key areas, communication and engagement. From a communication perspective, you should be telling people how's the data collected and how's it stored? There's lots of fears about GDPR and data security in today's society. Uh, modern telematics suppliers have really secure systems uh, and we work to protect that data at all costs. And drivers want to know that uh, that data is collected correctly and it's also stored correctly so their, their data is, is secure. As a business, what are you asking the drivers to do? You're putting this system in, you know, tell them why. Tell them why they need to be part of this process, why you want to become a safer fleet. What are the rules of engagement for your business? Now, there's no one set rule here that a, a business can take, but make it personal to you and explain how you're going to use the data and what it's going to impact their their working day around. You, you need to make sure that managers use it correctly and then all drivers are treated fairly through this process. That's really important. Then from engagement, help the, uh, the drivers understand why they're part of this process. It sort of links with the communication part quite nicely. And from a training perspective, you know, whether it's coaching from more experienced drivers within your fleet, or you use external schemes or driver trainers within your fleet, you know, that training aspect is something that we see achieves the best results time and again in terms of safety with fleets. And the final one, reward. People react really well to rewards in this process. We uh, have seen a wide ranging number of schemes that people will use to encourage their drivers to be safer. Now, some of the bigger businesses, they've given away a car at the end of a process. Some of the smaller ones give a gold sprayed hard hat uh, to the best driver of the week or the month. The, the, the schemes are really different in, in how, you, uh, how you approach this one, but my advice here is to, to make it personal to your business and make sure that it's something that can be repeated and is easy to talk about. Uh, don't make it too big that you can't sustain it in the long term. Another key element to the driver engagement is keeping them involved with the data. Uh, we as a business, we implement uh, an in-cab coach, which gives live driver, driver feedback about harsh acceleration, braking, speeding, idling events. It allows them to correct their behaviors while they're out driving, doing their jobs. We also uh, provide them with an app or website login so they can go in and actually see their data themselves. This takes away a lot of the fear uh, that they're there is something secret about this data. You know, they can see the harsh events that they've done. And then it, they know if they've got lots of these, they, they know they can expect a conversation with their manager. Or if they're doing quite well, you can see your group score. And you can try and have a competition internally with your other drivers about how you can improve. We also include a few other things on these apps, uh, things like um, business private mileage and also vehicle checks, which is another safety aspect of data that can be uh, collected. I've talked about a few of these best practice pieces already, but uh, these are a few of, uh, of our tips on, on how to uh, improve your results. Uh, the first for me is the data. Make sure you as a business are looking at this regularly. Some customers that we have do this daily and they, they're debriefing drivers at the end of the day. And do the same the following day, the following day, and it's, it's really quite intense. And they get great results. But I find that that can be a little overbearing for many businesses. So as a minimum, I'd always recommend that you're doing a weekly analysis of the data. Maybe you're getting a weekly report on a Monday for the previous week. And then you use that to provide regular feedback to the drivers, whether that's through a toolbox talk, just a quick conversation, whatever it might be. Find something that works for you, but make sure you do it regularly. The second one is trends. Make sure you are looking at the data over time. How are people improving week on week, month on month? Where were you last year in comparison to this year? This is really important to show people how this is still helping you as a business and that you are still making gains or at least maintaining the uh, improvements you've already made. Policy is my third one. 
ensure that this is part of your safety strategy moving forward and that you have it as a company-wide initiative. Uh, this should not be something that is piecemeal in certain groups within the business. You should use this as a business moving forward as a tool to help you improve your road safety. And inform. Comes back to that engagement piece I talked about before. Uh, celebrate these successes with your drivers. Show them the, the impact they are, they are making and then look to reward them where you can because that really will keep people engaged in this process. The final piece uh, of this webinar today is what change can you go and make tomorrow? Most of you have probably got some telematics in there already. And you can go very easily and, uh, and start a few of these things straight away. You can go and commend your best drivers. This has a much more positive effect on your driver safety than beating up the worst drivers is go and publicly recognize the best drivers of the week and the month. That goes a long way and people want to improve and achieve that recognition as well. So that is my number one. The second one is then start to work with your drivers that are at the other end of the scale. Look to improve them either through conversations or if they are repeated or having trouble, look at training them with some external driver trainers or an internal driver trainer if you have them. And then embed the, the final one, it's a bit more long term, but make this part of your business policy moving forward. The best results are achieved by people that have this as something the company always talks about. Oh, I've had a number of examples with customers over the years, but the best one I found was uh, recently was where a customer just said, oh, yeah, all we did was made sure that every month it was on our health and safety director's table and he would be personally phoning drivers at the top for this. And that then went through the company and they've continued then to achieve really good speeding results as part of this initiative. So having it part of your business moving forward is key. If you have any further questions after uh, this short webinar today, uh, please email us at info at mastonaut.com. Uh, we're also at the CV show that's uh, coming up very shortly and our web address www.mastonaut.com. Good afternoon. This is Jim Noble. I'm the Vice President of Risk Engineering for eDriving. eDriving is a global leader in fleet risk management products and services. As part of this presentation, I'm going to be taking you back to the beginning because policies and procedures should really be the very foundation of an effective risk management program. Policies are crucial for drivers to understand what is required of them and what is expected of them. They set the foundation for your whole safety culture and they make it clear to drivers exactly what behaviors will and will not be tolerated, how safe driving behaviors will be recognized and rewarded, and also how risky driving behaviors will be addressed. So onto the key elements of a fleet safety policy and procedure program. The ANSI Z15 and ISO 339001 are globally recognized standards that will help you develop your organization's policy and procedure program. Each of these standards stress the need to address high level points captioned on this slide, and they make excellent guides to help you assess the gaps in your own policy and procedure program. I'll briefly talk through each one of these five points uh, that we're covering in this section. So, definitions of management, leadership, and administration. It's important that your policy explains the risk that your drivers face and the purpose of the policy. Explain that drivers play a key role in the company's efforts to reduce collisions and incidents that may result in death, injury, or property damage. It's important to also outline your own responsibilities for keeping employees safe and make it clear that the policy helps you do just that with the ultimate aim of ensuring that your drivers get home safely and to their families at the end of every day. Your policy must have the backing of senior leadership, not just in words, but in actions that indicate road safety is embedded into, your, into the culture of your organization. Include statements of commitment along with safe working environment goals for the policy. Make it clear that requirements for the policy are exactly that, they're requirements. They're not optional. 
they're mandatory and adherence to policies and procedures will be measured. The policy should clearly state the consequences of non-compliance up to and including discharge if the violation is repeated and or egregious. Equally, it should clarify how great driving behaviors will be recognized and rewarded because that's also very important. The vehicle section of your policy should address both the use of company vehicles and the use of employee-owned vehicles or gray fleet. Clarify what is expected of the driver in terms of making sure that the vehicle is properly registered, taxed, insured, and serviced, including who is responsible for booking inspections and scheduling maintenance. Also specify that the vehicle checks that are required uh, to be done should be required frequently and when they should be carried out. As well as more obvious safety checks such as lights, indicators, tires, and brakes, provide instructions to help drivers set up their driving position, mirror adjustment, head restraints, and GPS before setting off. Steps that will help ensure a safer and more comfortable drive. Don't forget to include guidance for users on different types of vehicles. At eDriving, many of our clients in Asia, for example, have a large portion of employees that use two wheels. So your organization might have a combination of car drivers, truck drivers, and two-wheel or motorcycle riders. It's important that your policy address the different requirements related to the use of different types of vehicles, as well as offering, as offering risk factor suggestions associated with each type of vehicle. And the driver section should include your organization's requirements in terms of driver licensing, qualifications, insurance, skills, and training standards. It should also include behaviors and your organization's requirements in terms of drivers ensuring that they are fit to drive, planning journeys safely, and complying with road traffic safety laws when driving. For example, you might include details of eyesight test requirements, or guidance for getting adequate sleep to minimize the risk of fatigue. Also, avoiding morning after impairment by minimizing alcohol consumption the evening before driving could be something that's covered in this section. In addition, provide advice to drivers whom they should inform in the event of a health issue that could impact their driving ability. The operations section covers what will be expected while driving. Risk factors such as speeding and fatigue should be covered in detail in this section, including details about your company's rules covering mobile phones while driving. My recommendation is no talking, including hands-free, and of course texting, unless the vehicle is legally parked. The policy should also provide guidance to drivers on how they should adhere to these rules. For example, a recommendation to divert calls to voicemail while driving and to return calls only when parked safely and no longer in control of the vehicle. Don't forget other in-vehicle devices such as banning GPS manipulation while driving. This section should also cover management issues such as managing risk-free. So this means how to schedule a driver so that they can safely complete their day, or other items such as how to manage maintenance issues such as an out-of-service vehicle. The final section of your policy should provide guidance on what to do in the event that there is an incident, a breakdown, or emergency. This should include what the driver is expected to do at the scene of a collision, what information they need to record, whether or not they need to take photographs or sketch the scene, and what to do with the vehicle. Also, very important to cover here is how soon they must report an incident and who they should report it to. The same type of guidance should be provided to help drivers understand what to do in the event of an emergency or breakdown. So these are kind of the five key factors of driver safety policy. Obviously, this is not nearly an exhaustive list of what the recommended contents should be, but it gives you a hint of what is generally included in a complete policy portfolio. Now that we've talked about the components of a policy, I want to mention an important step. As a matter of fact, it's very important. 
you want to confirm formally that your drivers understand your policies and they can carry out the procedures necessary to implement the policy. At eDriving, we integrate this in as part of the initial setup of a safety culture. So once the policy has been defined and introduced to the drivers, they would be required to undertake an online module with policy-based questions that determine their level of knowledge and understanding. They would also be required to complete a formal pledge to confirm their commitment to these policies and procedures. Now, I've often asked what's the difference between a policy manual and a driver handbook? The simple answer is that your policy manual covers the organization and it includes a significant amount of detail about why policy is important, people responsible, and the consequences of not following that policy. Your driver handbook covers the essential information that your drivers need to know every day. It can really be useful to think of it as a glove box guide to your policies and procedures. So it's information that a driver can refer to as a glance, a summary of your policies and procedures if you want to think about it that way. So I hope you found this short little section of overview of policies and procedures useful. Of course, it was a very speedy run through, so I haven't been able to do a deep dive into any of the sections or requirements. However, I'd like to point you in the direction of the two standards I mentioned earlier, the ANSI Z15 standard or the ISO 39001. These are globally recognized standards that can help you determine exactly what you need to include in your policies and procedures. I'd be happy to chat with anyone directly who'd like more details, and I'm sure that the Global Fleet Champions program has additional resources that can help you develop your policy and procedures and handbooks. My details are included for anyone who'd like to get in touch or talk to me about anything that I've covered in this section. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the webinar. My name is Deviera Twisk and since May 2019, I'm a professor here at the Center of Accident Research and Road Safety in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. And before that, I worked at the Institute for Road Safety Research in the Netherlands. And I've done quite some work on training and education. And before I want to go into the more details, looking at what training and education can do, it has mainly two purposes in life. It helps you to master a complex skill so that you become an expert, meaning that you've learned to do it really well and that's reliable and efficient. In this presentation, I will show you the basic principle of that. And as a spoiler alert, the principles are rather easy, but the process is really hard. And that brings us to the second purpose, and that is to stay motivated, to do the things in a safe manner and not to give in to temptations such as distraction from mobile phones. And how do we use education for that? So these are the two areas that I want to cover. But first of all, education is not a something that you can use to solve all sorts of problems. I want to position it first to understand what education can and cannot do. And first of all, it assumes that the tasks that we expect people to do are well designed, not too complicated. And for road safety, it means that the roads are safe that the interactions on the road are predictable and even perhaps self-explaining and that tasks are made really easy. And just to give a practical and perhaps a little silly example, but if we design vehicles, it's very handy to have the clutch at the same locations and that we don't change priority rules at intersections just unexpectedly. And so we need to organize the work flow and the tasks such that they are doable and that distractions, for instance, are kept to a minimum. So that's one aspect that we need to take into account. But the other aspect is the person's capabilities. Some people will not be able to do everything we ask them to do. And we are very limited 
in terms of our abilities. And just to give you an example, that it is far more easy to change a task so that it becomes doable than to change a person. You know, raw milk is not good for your health. The best effective solution has not been to ask people to boil their milk every time they want to use it, but to make sure that all the milk that has been sold in supermarkets are pasteurized. So if we take that into account, are we skilled to do a task? How do we learn to become skilled to do a task? Well, actually, that's by training, just by practice. Practice makes perfect. And we acquire these complex skills just by doing it very often. And we do it very often correctly. If we look at, for instance, at the statistics of young people, we see that young people crash often at a very young age and that these crash risks decline with age. So you could easily think that that's mainly because they get older and become wiser. Here you see a graph in which you have the number of years a person is licensed, or his age actually, and his crash risk. And what you see here is the crash risk of a person who's licensed at 18, and then the more years he drives, the safer he gets. And here you have the crash risk of a person who licensed at 23. Also, his crash risk decreases with the number of years, but his initial risk is far lower than for the person who licenses at 18. So we do see some factor that's called age maturity. However, this is the decline that you see with age. And this is decline in risk with experience. So nowadays we consider experience, say practice on the task, to be a dominant factor in how people become safe on a task. Another illustration comes from a colleague of mine, um, Willem Flachfeld, who has looked at hazard perception. Here you have an example of a test in which we have recorded the eye movements of novice drivers in watching a potentially hidden hazard. Look at the red dots and you see where the focus of the novice driver is. This is the car that we are in and we are following this lead car. And here you see the fixations, everything is okay. We follow the car, here we have the lorry. And what you will notice is that he focuses on the lorry but misses the potential hazard in this area. Uh, just an example of what it means not to be experienced yet. There's more practice makes more perfect. But some people would argue, and they're correct, practice only makes permanent. It may, turns into a habit. So only perfect practice makes perfect if we want to learn a complex skill. It is this training that turns all our behaviors in automatic responses. So most of our actions when we become experienced are automatic so that we get more space in our head to attend to the more complex situations. But if this is how we learn, to be capable drivers, it's also the downside of how we do in traffic. These habits are very, very hard to change. And it needs a strong will and a lot of external support to change that. And we need to be prepared to fail and to go on. And there are many tools that we can use to do that and to help to changing these habits. We can inform and explain 
what the problems are. We can even persuade, meaning that we try to change a person's behavior, and we can go back to Aristotle even for that. He distinguishes between three elements in order to persuade a person to change. That's ethos, meaning that a person who's trying to convince another to change has to be of high moral standards. Well, actually, he needs to walk the talk. Pathos refers to that there needs to be an appeal element to it. And logos means that it should be logical, that we should be able to back it up with facts. An example could be to demonstrate, for instance, to what extent our performance deteriorate if we have used alcohol. That can be very convincing for people to see and very persuasive. But that's still not sufficient because we have this habit. And that means that these behaviors are more or less automatic and that we need to learn new routines. And for me, for instance, to break the routine of the habit of going by car, I had actually to sell my car. Yeah, that was quite something. But now I have a more active lifestyle in return, although I still enjoy driving cars a lot. Further, we do have lots of other instruments that we can use, for instance, monitoring, punishments, rewards, and all have their advantages and disadvantages. For instance, monitoring in-car systems can help us to keep to the speed limit by giving us continuously feedback about what our behavior is like and whether we still are following our goals. Punishment, for instance, by an external agent, can help us to be motivated, not to violate rules. However, it has many downsides in terms that it is a cat and mouse game and that you need to have a high chance of being caught. Further, it has low acceptance and often people see it as a, a much better tool for the, the neighbor to change his behavior than for oneself. And further, we have rewards and that works really well and is really underexplored in real safety interventions and can solve more problems than we think now. Another tool which is very popular is the fear evoking uh, information, hoping that people will change their behavior because they see these awful, awful consequences. It catches a lot of attention and therefore it is positive, but it can have very many downsides as well, only when it's under a person's control to be able to change that behavior, the person will try to follow the advice. If he doesn't believe it, it, it creates far more often resistance towards the message. And then it's even counterproductive. To conclude, education is an integrated part and cannot solve problems that are caused by bad design of tasks. Further, education is limited by the person's capability. So know who you hire. Remember that it's often more effective to change the task than to change the behavior of a person. So remember the example of boiled milk. And training helps to acquire the necessary skills, but only perfect practice makes perfect. This also refers to the higher order skills, such as hazard perception. Education to change behavior is far more tricky. One has many tools, but changing habits requires a lot of willpower. So failure should be reckoned with and reward should be available at each step. Of all tools, fear appeals should be used with great care. To sum it all up, education and training is how we learn to difficult tasks in life with help from persons we all trust. That's all. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's break webinar sponsored by Allianz. 
I'm sure we've met some of you previously, but for those of you who haven't had the pleasure, or is it misfortune, I'm Martin Cadden, Partnership Director and one of the founders of Lightfoot. What are we really here to discuss today? We're talking about driver behavior in the context of fleet safety. But really, I think it's much more than that. It's innovation. Anything that can improve drivers and save lives is truly innovative. Rewarding drives is something new and different, and the results it can deliver are huge. When putting this presentation together, I was reminded of something a fleet manager said to me only recently. My job is busy. My job is varied. But knowing that every single driver is getting home safely each night is by far and away the most important part of my job. We at Lightfoot understand as a business how responsible you are as fleet managers, as managing a fleet is spread to managing drivers. But how can you really manage a driver's behavior when they're the one behind the wheel? Lightfoot is about pushing the responsibility of driving off the fleet manager and back onto the shoulders of the individual driver. We give them the tools to be a better driver, the target for them to aim for, and the rewards for achieving it. Everyone wants better drivers, from the finance director looking at their claims report to the mother crossing the road with her children. Today, I get to share with you what we've been achieving for some of our fleet clients. For businesses, there are common reasons for wanting better drivers. Satisfying duty of care, getting their employees home safely at the end of every day, reducing operational costs, ensuring that members of the public who share the roads with them are safe, and protecting and promoting the brand displayed on vehicles. Fleet managers, as we know, are very busy people. The clue is in the title. A fleet, by definition, is made up of vehicles, not drivers. For years, you've been using technology to understand how your vehicles have been driven. But understanding vehicles doesn't change driver behavior. A fleet manager cannot change driver behavior for a sustained period of time. The person responsible, the driver, has to make that change. We have nearly 200 businesses using Lightfoot, but many of their drivers, such as those at Virgin Media or Southwest Water, are engineers, technicians, technical tradespeople. None of these people would describe themselves as a driver even though they can spend most of their day at work behind the wheel of a vehicle. At Lightfoot, working with the University of Bath and their driver psychology team, we've learned how to really understand drivers and how they think. Therefore, we can acknowledge and reward them for the part of their day that they don't even consider to be work. With over 20,000 fleet drivers using Lightfoot, we're not stopping there. We're now helping consumer drivers through Halfords and soon to be Amazon, so that every driver can now be rewarded for their driving. Replacing black boxes in the consumer world means we can actually improve drivers rather than just gather data on them. To truly address driver behavior, we must first understand how drivers perceive their driving. A leading driver training company recently revealed in a poll that 86% of drivers believe they are an above average driver. The other day someone said to me, that sounds low. So when a business asks a driver to be better, the driver will think, what's in it for me? I'm already a good driver. The answer is lots of things, but you have to be better. And Lightfoot will give you the tools and the target to do that. And then we will reward you. So that's why we reward drivers for being better. But what does a fleet of better drivers actually look like? Most importantly, better drivers are involved in fewer crashes. They help businesses be safe, compliant, and respected for their safety. Businesses have used all sorts of systems to try and improve driver behavior. Some look promising, then fade away. Some cost a lot and deliver very little. At Lightfoot, we know our mission. We've clearly defined how and why we reward drivers. Telematics can harness huge amounts of vehicle data. Cameras can be a great defensibility tool, but in the end, it isn't vehicles that have collisions. It's drivers. Using apps to see how they drove last week is not going to stop the crash that happened yesterday. With Lightfoot's real-time visual and audible guidance, we give the driver the information they need to be better, and we reward them for using it. Telematics is data, and data does not reduce crashes. Fleet managers using telematics data to improve driver behavior can reduce crashes, but it might be short-lived. Lightfoot does reduce crashes. Today's webinar is sponsored by Allianz. Lightfoot works with most major underwriters, but we have a very special relationship with Allianz. As an underwriter, 
No one has more experience with, than them with the application of Lightfoot in the real world and the results it can deliver. We have worked with them as a risk management partner for four years. They have verified Lightfoot reducing at claims, at fault claims by as much as 60% in some cases. They have verified loss ratio reductions from 200% to 77% in one recent case. And the well being and rewarding of drivers in every single case. Channelmatics does a great job of telling you what your problems are. Lightfoot actually solves them. The bottom line is that many risk management initiatives can be expensive, boring, a challenge to implement, and, and frustrating to use. The best risk management initiative out there is the one that your business really wants to get behind. An initiative that rewards drivers will free up fleet management time, satisfy health and safety and duty of care obligations, boost your environmental credentials, and provide a significant return on investment for the board of directors. An initiative that rewards drivers is good for everyone. If rewarding better driving can do all of that, why would you not be rewarding drivers within your organization? Why would you not consider Lightfoot, or at least talking to us about rewarding your drivers for being better? I've talked a lot about Lightfoot and how we approach improving driver behavior, but I'd rather finish by showing you the results of our approach. Judy Deard and the Barclay Insurance Group said of Lightfoot, I have practical experience with a client whose driver behavior changed dramatically over a couple of weeks with Lightfoot. I have over 30 years in motor fleet claims experience, and in my opinion, Lightfoot is the best way to improve driver behavior. The Montel Group of companies reduced at-fault collisions by 80% after just one year with Lightfoot in their fleet. This isn't us fluffing the figures. This has come directly from their broker, Dunsby Associates, who said, it is clear that drivers are safer thanks to Lightfoot. Greencore cut 112 tons from their carbon footprint in one year. Their network and transport director said that Lightfoot has been key in encouraging and empowering our drivers. Now that Lightfoot is installed in almost all of their 4,000 vehicles, Virgin Media expect to save 1 million litres of fuel a year. A million litres of fuel. The team at Virgin have been so happy with Lightfoot and the improvements that they've seen in driver behaviour that they've recorded a video testimonial for us at the end of last year. I'll now let you hear from Dave Hodgson of Virgin Media. But I think what I'm happy to say now, having run the units um, for a year, is that we're seeing regular and consistent fuel benefits at around 11.5%. Can't think of many other actions we could have taken uh, other than restricting the mileage of our vehicles to get such fantastic fuel savings. Uh, we've seen a positive benefit of around 18 to 20 percent. So that's really encouraging. Obviously the environmental impact as well, uh, fantastic, reduced CO2 emissions. Uh, we take our corporate responsibility very seriously. The drivers are engaging really well with the product. Uh, they uh, are keen to compete with one another. They love the uh, rewards and the prize element. And, and actually, we've seen um, a really consistently high performance with the product. It's helping our drivers be more conscious and in the vehicle when they're driving. And as a result, we've seen uh, their risks reduce. Lightfoot are engaging, they're encouraging, they're fun. So to that end, it's been very easy to work with them. They listen, they've taken the time to understand our business. Um, and that helps, it makes it much easier to, to work with a group of people who um, are enthusiastic and know their product. The journey's been uh, an adventure uh, and it continues to be uh, an adventure. I wouldn't have changed it. Compelling stuff, huh? Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to learn a little bit more about the benefits of improving driver behavior. There are many tried and proven ways to create better drivers. Lightfoot is one of them. If you wish to discuss anything you've heard today in any more detail or ask questions and learn about how Lightfoot can help reward your drivers for being better, then please pick up the phone or email me and we can speak directly. Otherwise, we can contact Lightfoot through your insurance broker. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. We've now come to the end of um, today's formal presentations and it's time for our Q and A session. It's not too late for you to uh, put forward your questions, so please do so via the chat box. Firstly, I would like to thank you for engaging in today's poll. Okay, so you can see those results on screen now. Um, I'm just going to 
um, hand over to Louise, one of our panellists, who is going to comment on the results of that. It's an interesting one. I think um, a lot of us form our opinions on things from bias, from from media presentations, and also, you know, what's reported in the news. And, that, you know, obviously, I think a lot of us can admit that over the last few years there's been some fantastic and wonderful campaigns and around education training publicity and awareness and enforcement on drink driving drug driving mobile phone use uh, certainly with enforcement changes and speeding and i think less so with driving with fatigue and health conditions there's definitely been a lot less coverage out there about this um i think a lot of the reasons is at the minute we haven't really got uh, the blood test the breath test at the minute we haven't got the technology at this present time to kind of put definitive numbers on actually how many collisions are caused by fatigue and health conditions um, and, and my presentation was looking at some specific health conditions but there are many many more where they actually would contribute to some of those other causation factors a lot of people um, may be self-medicating through alcohol uh, maybe using medications over the counter remedies or prescribed medications to con control and um, the symptoms which will then obviously potentially lead to collisions and also a lot of health conditions can lead to fatigue um, so for me um, unreported health conditions I think does present a bit of a, an unprecedented risk that maybe a lot of people aren't quite aware of. Thank you um, Louise I've got a, another uh, question here for you um, as well from one of today's attendees um, how can we get more drivers to report potentially sensitive conditions like stress or mental health issues? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the golden question, isn't it? And not just in relation to driving. Um, I'm also carry out some health and safety consultancy work and the management of stress within the workplace. It, it's a massive topic. Um, and I think you, you need to look at your wider picture and not just about stress and mental health whilst driving, but within the wider policy or, you know, of your organisation. Um, the HSE um, have a toolkit online it's called the H um, the health and safety uh, stress management standards and then there it's it's looking at how you can manage stress in the workplace um, and improving the stress in your workplace will have a positive impact across you know even your driving activity in terms of what that might look like it's you know consulting with your staff a lot more finding out what is it that may be sources of stress within the workplace um, linking up with um, your occupational health if you have that engaging in health questionnaires Having health champions and mental health first aiders has been proven to have a real beneficial effect in encouraging people to kind of speak out in the workplace. I think raising awareness is always going to be a priority. Um, I think a lot of people will suffer in silence and won't realise what supports out there. And making sure that your managers take it into account during one-to-ones and supervisions, appraisals or whatever process you have. And Offering an open door, you know, a supportive environment. I think support, uh, support, not suspicion was the term I used in my presentation. And I just think it's really important that people don't have that fear that they're going to lose their job or reduced hours or, or moved elsewhere just because, you know, they're suffering from a condition at the minute that's, you know, interfering with their work and in specifically in this case with their driving. OK, thank you very much, Louise. Um, we've got a question here for Adam, who is joining us today um, representing Masternaut. Would you recommend encouraging competition between drivers um, or do you think this could be detrimental? Uh, it's a really good question. I'd actually say uh, on the whole, I'd encourage uh, in competition. I'd kind of recommend people encourage it. It's something that we've seen quite a lot, actually, that the more tools you give to the driver with regard to driver behavior and their own driving style the better they tend to become so that was partly what uh, we were getting at in the presentation when we were talking about uh, the app that's available and the in-cab driver device because it means that drivers can actually start seeing their own data but by encouraging competition it tends to take things a bit further because no longer is the driver just concerned with how they are driving they're putting it into context with how everybody else is driving and fairly obviously nobody wants to be the worst at anything so nobody really wants to be at the top of that leaderboard so it means that drivers start talking to each other about how they're driving drivers will start actively engaging with one another and actively trying to beat each other in their driver behavior league tables 
Now, all of that, of, of course, depends on the kind of policies you've got in place and the, the sort of culture you've got as to whether or not the drivers are going to be able to do that. But what we tend to find is the more you treat drivers as adults in this, the more receptive they are to it. The more data you give them, the more of their own data you give them, the better it is. The more you encourage them to get involved with this rather than just using it as um, something to monitor them with, then the more engaged they are, the more they tend to, to get involved with it. So yes, I'd say it's a good idea to encourage competition. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, and a couple of questions for uh, Jim. And so, Jim, the first question, um, do you have more advice on how to secure buy-in from senior leadership for a new policy? Great question. Thank you. If I had a, um, a potion for that, I would certainly bottle it and I would, uh, I would retire on the money that I can make out of it. But uh, the answer really is it depends on the safety culture within your organization to begin with. And, and what you're trying to accomplish. So if, if senior leadership is not invested already in, uh, in motor fleet safety, then you're going to have to do a comprehensive job of selling them on why it's important and why it's important to the bottom line. And, and don't be afraid to bring in uh, hard cost items, uh, such as Adam was mentioning around fuel savings, um, you know, those types of things, wear and tear on the vehicle. All of those are byproducts of a good safety program uh, and have hard dollar figures that you can uh, point to in addition to reducing metal costs, lost productivity, all the th types of things that go along with crashes. So the less invested that your senior leadership is in the safety culture around fleet safety in your organization, the more uh, items you're going to have to bring into that uh, and call it what it is, a sales presentation. So um, if, if there's already an investment, you're just going to have to uh, talk about the benefits of individual policies and procedures and how they enhance the safety culture of your organization. Thanks, Jim. And just one, one further question. Um, where can we look for some examples of good fleet safety policies and driver handbooks? That's a tougher one because, you know, everybody now goes to the search engines on the web and says, you know, show me good examples of this. And there really isn't many good examples of what those policies and procedures should look like. You know, I know Brake has a couple good examples of of policies and procedures. You may look at some local resources in the UK, such as Fleet Safety Management Company. Um, they have some good examples. Uh, there's some good folks over there. Uh, and also, if you have my contact information through this webinar. Uh, I'll be more than glad to supply you with, uh, with a couple examples of, of policies and procedures. Uh, and again, some of this depends on what you're trying to accomplish, how detailed it has to be, what you already have in place. And, and a lot of it has to do with how your HR department or um, uh, personnel staff want to present these and the consequences of policies and procedures. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for attending um, today's webinar, and we hope you enjoyed it, and that the webinar has equipped you with useful information that will help you to work towards our common goal of safe and healthy mobility and fleets. Um, to view our upcoming webinars, please visit globalfleetchampions.org. And we welcome your feedback, so please do complete our short feedback form, which will appear on your screen once the webinar ends. And if you would like to discuss the content of today's webinars further, um, please join our Global Fleet Champions LinkedIn group. A big thank you to today's presenters um, and, of course, to our sponsor, Alliance. And we hope you can join us again, too. Thank you very much.